Happy Sunday. We want to carry on with the preaching on the uh, book of James, and today we close chapter 2, actually. And it is actually an extension of last week's preaching. Remember last week we were talking about faith without work. Uh, and today we go into another aspect of faith without work. Last week I talked about how, you know, when James started talking about this, last week's sermon was a kind of preparation for this week's sermon. So let's review a little bit as to what was taught last week. Last week's passage was from uh, verses 14 to 17, and I entitled it J217, so that you remember James chapter 2, verse 17, that faith without work is dead. And that's the key kind of a focus. But last week's sermon was focused a lot more on works relating to charity, works relating to working among the poor, among us. And this week's sermon will go further deeper into what works means. And the passage seemingly was a contradiction to Paul's teaching on salvation by grace through faith. And I told you that, you know, people are very confused about this since the earliest days, including as experts like Martin Luther, who is the one who started the whole Reformation, of course. And Martin Luther thought that James is a very lightweight kind of a book that shouldn't have a place in the Bible. And especially this particular place, Martin Luther thought that James is teaching that you are saved by doing good works. And since the Bible does not say so, especially from the Apostle Paul, Martin Luther was very unhappy about the inclusion of James in the canonical Bible. But this is just a kind of a false dichotomy or a false understanding because the Apostle James was referring to faith that cannot save in verse 17. That he's talking about people who have faith that cannot save. This as opposed to saving faith, faith that can save. Therefore, James was talking about people who have false faith in the first place. And indeed, we look at the two verses uh, between Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, and Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we will see that Paul exact, has exactly the same idea uh, as James. And that is, first of all, we affirm that we are saved not by works. No matter how many good works you do in your life, no matter how much impact you have on humanity, you cannot be saved just by your works alone. This, the Bible, is very clear. But at the same time, Ephesians 2, verse 10 says that we are God's creation or the creation of Christ, and we are saved for good works. So that's the correct understanding, that we are not saved by good works, we are saved for good works. So it's a question of order. Where do you put the order of good works? But this comes about because there is great confusion as to what faith is all about. And actually today we will carry on talking a little bit more about the confusion about faith. Uh, so much so that a person like Richard Stern of World Vision, he wrote a book called Whole in the Gospel. Richard Stern said that, you know, our understanding of gospel has a very big hole in that we always think that a gospel means that we go and talk someone into Jesus Christ and we just talk, 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 or we just go and evangelize and we have gospel rallies, we have seminars, we have conferences, and, and that's about it. We don't have to care very much about how people live or what other people do, especially the desperate and the poor in the world today. And Richard Stearns go back to the Bible and say that if you take a Bible and you cut out all the portions relating to poor people, then you have a very holy Bible, a Bible with a lot of holes, because you have a Bible that you cannot be read. In other words, it's very much a part of what the gospel is all about, this whole idea that our good works must be part of what our faith is all about. And I wanted to help you understand this from the fundamental principles in the Bible. And we started out by talking about how from the very first book of the Bible, from the very first chapter of the Bible, the Bible declared that every human being is made in the image and likeness of God. And I kept emphasizing to you, not only in last week's sermon, but in many sermons, that this is such a fundamental bedrock of our understanding because it really defined and direct the way we should live our life, the way we treat people, the way we look at each other. And I remember asking you to think about someone whom you know in your life, whom you are so disgusted with, you are so unhappy with, there's someone that you really hate, somebody who is really evil, that you know of in your life. And I said that even that person is made in the image and likeness of God. And a little bit to my present surprise after the sermon, some people came and tell me that, you know, Pastor, you asked me to think about that person, and I thought about that person, you know. And you say that that person is made in the image and likeness of God. It's such a very difficult thing for me to accept. 
and uh, one of the people said that I've decided then to forgive that person. And I thought it's a wonderful thing to do. But this is really true, that every human being is made in the image and likeness of God. The Bible has no other description about the image and likeness of God other than the humankind. And that's a very important thing for you to remember. The Bible doesn't say that a building has the image of God or a movement has the image of God or some wonderful preacher has the image of God or a denomination has the image of God. But the human being is made in the image and likeness of God. And so because of that, to love and to serve God means primarily to love and serve people made in His image and likeness. However small they are, however desperate they are. And last week we read from Matthew chapter 25, the Lord Jesus Christ spoke about the sheep and the goat. And Jesus said, if you serve the least among these, you are serving me. And this principle comes about from the understanding that the least among us is too made in the image and likeness of God. So that's the first key reason. The second reason is that the Bible declared that we are ambassadors of Christ. We are God's chosen means to be His channel of blessing. Now this is something that a lot of people don't understand as well because we keep thinking that if God wants to, He can change the world with a snap of His finger and He can do something. It got nothing to do with me. Recently in Facebook, I don't know whether you caught this or not, there was a picture of a little boy in uh, the Philippines who was studying by the light of a McDonald's. Have you seen that one? You know, those of you who are on social media, it's a very touching thing. This little boy went to the homeless kind of a person. His house was burned down in a slum. And so he went to study by the light of the McDonald's with a makeshift kind of a, a table. And so a lot of people got very touched and people come up with money and they wanted to donate money, which is very typical. You know, Habitat for Humanity, the organization that I hate in Singapore, we go to help uh, Habitat Philippines to build slums. And my goodness, you know, the number of slums they have is quite incredible. And, you know, I was interested, I look at the comments that people put up under this. Some people keep saying that, you know, it's such a stupid idea because this is just one boy out of millions of people, right? And other people put in the comment that, you know, it's really none of my business, but, you know, the things that these people do only give you a little bit here and there, doesn't help, blah, blah, blah. And you see a lot of people being very critical and not very happy that this is the case. And a lot of people express the opinion that, well, I cannot do anything anyway. Now, this is not the biblical understanding. The biblical understanding is that we are the channel of God's blessing. And if we choose not to do anything, Matthew 25, the passage before the sheep and the goat was the parable of the talent. If we choose not to do anything like the guy with the one talent who buried his talent on the ground and did nothing, then God will allow the situation of the world to continue to deteriorate. Generally speaking, God can intervene, but primarily, most of the time, He chooses His people to be the channel of His blessing. That's the way He has designed the world to be. Guess what? One fine day, He will hold you accountable for the time and the space and the resources that He has given to you in your lifetime, just as He would hold the steward with that one talent who did nothing accountable in the parable in Matthew 25. So that's the second reason why we ought to do something. The third reason is that we are the privileged few in a desperate world that is filled with all sorts of human suffering. Too much to even talk about. So we are placed in a place in Singapore or in parts of Indonesia for some of you. We are the privileged few. I show you a comic drawing of a seesaw where most of the humanity is one side and the, the privileged are over here. And I told you that we are the people over here. Every single person in Singapore, if you look at the whole of humanity and the whole of the world, belong to that privileged few. And the suffering of the world is really quite crazy, isn't it? Sometimes you think about it and the situation that the world is in. I was watching a movie just the other day and there was one line that came up from the movie that caught my attention. There was a bad, bad guy who was talking about how the world is so terrible we should destroy the whole world. It's a classic bad guy kind of a statement. And he said something that I thought was very interesting. He said that humanity is so messed up that we are facing or we are trying to solve the problem of obesity and starvation at the same time. And I thought, wow, the movie writer has got good insight. Huh? That humanity is so messed up that we are trying to face the problem or trying to solve the problem of obesity, which is 
when you become really, really fat, and starvation at the same time. And that's so true, you know. My headquarters is in Atlanta, Georgia, and every time I go there to have a meeting, I can't help but think about that, you know, because my fellow Americans, well, no, my, my fellow American co-workers, they are really big people, huge. And they can be so big that their head looks small. Have you noticed that? Uh, and I, I figure out that because the human head doesn't grow very much, no matter how much you eat, your head sort of stay more or less. <laughs> but your body can keep growing. And so it was an illusion, right, that they have very small head. They don't. They just have very, very big body. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons is because every lunch break, they're eating fried chicken and all kinds of piles of it, right? You know, piles of fried chicken, piles of fried stuff and French fries and what have you. Obesity. Morbid obesity, where you can be so very, very fat that it's morbid, meaning you're going to die from it. So at the same time, the world, a lot of people were starving and dying. We are solving both obesity and starvation at the same time. And so we are placed in a world that is so very, very messed up. And the main reason and the last and the big reason why we ought to do something is this is indeed the right way to live life. All of scripture tells us it is more blessed to give than to receive. And this is a very, very personal thing for me that I wish that I am able to convey these feelings I have in my life where there are so many, many occasions when I realize that this is it. This is right. This is where it is. This is where my life fits. It's like a jigsaw puzzle, you know, your last puzzle. Pop, it went in right there. And all of Scripture comes alive when you realize that God has made us to be instrument of His blessings for others primarily. Not to say that you don't take care of your family or the people you love. But God has made us beings to go out there and touch life and share His gospel with the people around us. Remember what Pastor Tim Keller said. There are three main reasons how you preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. The first one is the acts of evangelism, which are the things that we do, gospel rally, we share the gospel with people one-to-one. -one. The second one is by your work and your identity. Exactly who you are preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the third one is when you care for the poor and uphold justice wherever you may be. And I thank God that he has mentioned all these three things because all three came from the Bible. Let us not have illusions of spiritual growth where we think that we are growing spiritually because we talk a lot, we preach a lot, we attend a lot of Bible study, we attend a lot of conferences, we attend a lot of seminars, we train and train and train and train, but we leave no finger whatsoever to help the people. And so I ended with J217, the kind of organization that we want to form, not the church, but a group of like-minded people, to remind us that James 2.17 is right, that faith without works is dead. And so through the J217 organization, we want to go out there and do more work. One of them will be our orphanage in Batam that I've mentioned so very often. And today we want to end chapter 2 with a whole set of uh, teachings that follow on with the idea of faith without work is dead. But this time around, the Apostle James go a lot deeper than just a kind of deeds relating to helping the poor, but deeds of faith, deeds that are a lot more associated with every single day life and about spirituality. With that in mind, let us come to God in the word of prayer and commit the time into His almighty hand. Let us pray. We thank you, O God, for calling all of us here this morning. We ask that you give us a humble heart. The Bible says that you oppose the proud, but you give grace to the humble. Help us to be teachable. Help us to recognize that before you, no matter how successful we are, we are but a humble human being whose very breath is in your hands. So whoever we may be, however victorious we think our life is or however much failure we think our life turned out to be help us to come before you and cast all these things upon you for you care for us that we may be like a little child for jesus christ said that unless we are like a little child we will never enter the kingdom of god help us O oh god then to listen to you have special mercy on your unworthy servant may the words of his mouth and the meditation in order our heart and mind be deemed acceptable in your sight for you are god and our redeemer in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Now, I started earlier by saying that a lot of our problem is this whole idea of faith confusion. The idea of what faith is all about is really quite a confusing thing today. I mean, if I were to just ask any one of you what faith really is, you will find that it's a little bit hard to explain. And there are a couple of reasons for this. One of them is that we are limited in language and expressions. As a translator of, for the senior pastor, you know, I'm very bicultural. So I have a very keen understanding of the limitation of languages. Because some things in English, when you translate to Mandarin, it's another thing altogether. And I always think that English is a very superficial and very shallow language compared to Mandarin. Uh, I, I sometimes much prefer to preach in Mandarin because the Mandarin word is a pictogrammic kind of a word, right? And which is why it's so difficult. That's why Singaporean kids hate Chinese because it's not alphabetical. You have to memorize every single thing, you know. To be good in Mandarin, you probably have to memorize at least 6,500 characters uh, before you can even start a conversation, let alone other languages. But even in the use of the Bahasa language, for example, sometimes when Dr. Tong is preaching in Mandarin, he would switch to Bahasa, sort of assuming that I understand, you know. Then I have to, actually, I don't know what you're talking about, you know, because language has limitation and every language is able to describe something in an angle that is different. So when you look at the English word faith, very often it's limited by our cultural understanding or our own preconceived notion of what faith is all about. Not only that, one of the key reasons why faith is very misunderstood is this whole idea of our consumer-based desire. That we are now in a consumer-driven society where I am the king, I am the consumer, right? I come to the church because I want to get something from this church. So if this pastor make me feel bad, I'm going to go to another pastor who will make me feel good. If this church doesn't entertain me, then I go to another church that will entertain me. It's all about me. And I have many, many choices in Singapore. And every morning as I come by here, I walk from the back here. I think on this floor, at least you have three choices. Number one, the Emmanuel Chinese Church, Mainland Chinese Church uh, at the end. And then after that, the Bahasa service people, always in white and black, you know, very disciplined, standing down there waiting for people to come. And then finally, our church. I mean, you can have another church, four or five. Sometimes you walk down Pasi Panjang Road, especially in Singapore. I think there are like six different churches along that road. You want a charismatic church, you can go there. You want a conservative church, you can go there. You want to go to a church where you have rock and roll, you can go there. So it's so many choices and we are spoiled for choices and it influences the way we think about faith as well. And we don't want faith that make us feel bad. So some of the phrases that are very subtle but important is, for example, what does the Bible say to me versus what the Bible says? Only two words different, right? What the Bible says to me versus what the Bible says. In the Reformed Evangelical Church, we take the first one or the second one? The second one. The first one, however, is a lot more popular. Everybody wants to know what the Bible says to me. So if I think that a homosexual lifestyle is right, then I will read the Bible to have it say that to me. If I think that you know being a selfish and being self-centered and living a life where I live in Sentosa Cove or whatever is the right thing, then I will want the Bible to say that to me, as opposed to what the Bible actually say full stop. So these are some of the key reasons. And of course, another reason are the prevalence of false teaching, something that I kept repeating over and over again from this pulpit because it's so strong and so permeating and going into every aspect of the world today. For example, prosperity gospel. The idea that if you believe in God, you have everything. That God will give you health, God will give you wealth. It's extremely attractive kind of an idea. Uh, never mind that it's very similar to local religion and Taoism and kind of Chinese religion that we are familiar with. The other day in Facebook, I saw a very wonderful poster. It says, worship me and I will give you everything. And it was framed in a very nice kind of a setting. And it sounds very Christian, right? Worship me and I will give you everything. Guess where the quotation comes from? It's from the Bible. And this word is actually from Satan. Uh, in Luke uh, chapter 3, as in the temptation of Jesus Christ, the very last one. Worship me and I will give you everything. 
and you think that it's very God-like, you know, especially in some of these prosperity gospel churches. That's what they are saying. You worship God, you get everything. You get everything great, everything nice, all the good things in life. High life, you know, you get to live. Except that this day, Sentosa Cove is no longer the high life, right? Worship me, I give you everything. is actually from Satan. So this is a very permeating kind of an idea. And another teaching that is coming up fast and strong is the teaching of hyper-grace. Hyper-grace means that you don't have to do anything to be saved. That it is all about the grace of God. doesn't matter what you do, hands off, after you become a Christian because Jesus Christ will forgive you yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and forevermore kind of a thing. So you don't no need to spend time confessing. Now, before our worship service, we always have a preparatory prayer time. We pray through ACTS, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, Supplication, so that you prepare your heart to come and meet God. And confession is part of it. This is part of Reformed understanding. That the Bible teaches us that we are not sinless. We just sin less. Nonetheless, even sin less means that for the rest of our life, we will never be made perfect. We have to encounter our sin and come before God and be honest with Him. And so we confess our sin. In hyper grace, you don't do things like that because confessing of sin makes you feel terrible, makes you feel bad. You know? And this is a very popular kind of teaching today. And many other mega churches in Singapore teach hyper grace in one form or another. And the influence is so strong that just three days ago I was in a cab. Cab driver was listening to a sermon. Uh, by a pre- local preacher that preaches about hyper grace. And I was quite intrigued, you know, I was listening to it and I started talking to the cab driver because as Dr. Stephen Tong says, we all never preach to the cab driver, so I try to make that a part of my life. I always try to steer them towards the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I asked the cab driver, why are you listen to, to this, uh, this pastor? He said, oh, this guy is anointed. You know, another one of the words that is used very often, anointed preacher. So I say, what do you mean by that, anointed preacher? He said, because when he preaches, I feel good. You know, I feel good. Nah, 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 because he preached. And, and that's a very important thing because he's, that shows that he is anointed kind of a preacher. And of course, as I was listening to him, I realized that, hey, this guy is preaching hyper grace. Much of the things he say has no biblical basis, but it's popular and he's happy and he's, he's uh, something that everybody likes. And I left the cab feeling a deep, deep sense of sadness, you know, because those of us who labor for the Lord in preaching the truth of God has impact that is quite limited. Whereas those who preach things that are changed and modified from the Bible has such impact. Uh, I always been showing you pictures of some of their gathering, right? This whole gang of you put there is just one tiny little dot pop, you know, in their whole stadium full of people. And this is a very serious situation. And so there are missing links all over the places. What's the missing link? Why is it that sometimes we don't get it about our faith? What about us? When we think about our faith, what is the thing that is missing? Why are we not as effective as we ought to be? And this passage of James actually goes into this area. After talking about how we shouldn't simply tell a poor guy that, hey, you know, be warm and be filled, you know, uh, uh, be of good cheer, uh, carry on, jia yu, jia yu, go home. And don't do anything. James said, that's nonsense, okay? It, it got nothing to, this kind of faith without the work is dead. James went on to then talk about a deeper kind of deeds of faith. Verse 18, someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show, your, show me your faith apart from your work and I will show you my faith by works. What James meant was that when I teach about faith and work, somebody will come up, a fellow will object me, uh, James, who will object to James, will say that, hey, you know, I can have faith, you can have work. So I do my faith thing, you do your work thing, and that's about it. Both are good enough. You don't have to combine the two together. That's what the verse means. Someone will say, you have faith and I have works. And there are people who think like that too. That some people should be focused only on faith things. Uh, In the Roman Catholic Church, for example, there is many groups of different kind of nuns, different kind of monks, different kind of 
groups of people that practices the Roman Catholic faith differently. I don't know whether you know it or not, but in Singapore, there is a group of uh, nuns in a convent uh, near Mount Faber area. They belong to the category that is very focused on faith. And so these people live in a convent without any contact with the outside world. Their job is to be focused on faith-based things and pray all the time. And so in order to, to, to visit them or to pass things to them, they have a revolving window, you know. They move and you put a thing inside, then eh, you go to the back. You don't even see their face. And they have taken a vow to stay in a convent and never come out until the day they die. And this is one of the only places in Singapore with a colobarium inside for cremation. So even at death, you can come out, okay? And, and I have a, a co-worker who says she wants to join a place like that. I say, sure, you know, you look, you always, you always go for bar chow me and all this kind of thing. I don't think this common thing will work for you. But there are people who do that. They, they, they focus the idea that I'm going to just pray, pray, pray. I'm not going to do anything else because that's the most important thing. Then, of course, there are people who just focus on charitable work, 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 work and it's not faith-based. They don't care. And you just do good among the people got nothing to do with faith whatsoever. That's what the objection means. And so James says, show me your faith apart from your works. James is saying, this is not possible. It's not possible to have true faith that has no work, nothing whatsoever. And so by this phrase, James denied that we should go into some kind of enclave somewhere and just pray, pray, pray and do nothing for the rest of your life. And James says, I will show you my faith by my works. In other words, James is declaring that true faith gives true work. And it's vice versa too. True work gives true faith. And the key word is true. What is pleasing to God? A true faith must give rise to true works. Not organized work only, but work that comes from the heart. Work that, that, that is real work that you go out there and you touch this life out from your heart and when you do true work it must come from true faith so there are many kind of works out there some works are not true only true work can come from true faith and remember that god is the giver of everything good and everything that is perfect and james then went on to really explain and jump into this whole idea and discussion of what faith is all about. Verse 19, you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. And so James wanted to talk about what true faith is all about. Now, faith is a very complex kind of uh, a message. And I've often said that there are some topics that I don't quite like to preach about. I don't quite like to preach about faith. I don't quite like to preach about prayer. I don't quite like to preach about love. Very simply because I don't have enough faith, don't have enough love, and I don't pray enough. And it's a very complicated kind of a topic. But just in case you think of it as too complicated, I must also tell you that faith, in a sense, is something that we practice all the time. Sometimes when you talk to someone who don't believe in God, right, you want to share the gospel with someone, the guy say, hey, you know, you guys are crazy. You believe in God that cannot see. You can believe in so many things that... Is a matter of the heart that is invisible. The answer is that you are not much better, you know. There are many different kinds of faith. I'll say that I will classify it in, in a few areas, but of course there's much more than that, so I can only bring out a few. First, I will use the word entry-level faith. This is a faith that actually all of us have. Now let me show you a picture. Have you seen this before? Any one of you? For all you know, it may be in your pocket right now, right here. My late father showed me one of these many, many years ago, and I thought it was a toy kind of a piece of paper. You know, it's a $10,000 Singapore note. I don't know whether you know this or not, but Singapore is the one country in the world, one of the few countries in the world with huge denomination note. Now, I know in Indonesia, you have 100,000, 500,000. You have 1 million. Yeah? What's the biggest in Indonesia? 500. Am I right? 100,000. Okay. I, I meant note that has value, la, real value. Okay? 10,000 note in Singapore is a very high denominational value, and it's real. 
uh, in every single note that you have in Singapore, there is fine print written underneath the number of zeros. And the fine print says, this note is legal tender. Okay? Now, in some other countries, the note will say the bank of ABC country promises to pay something, something, something. Now, this $10,000 note is also one of the reasons why the Singaporean government is always criticized by our neighboring countries. Because if you have 100 piece of this, which is about this thick, how much money is that? Do your math quick. One million, very good. So, oh, this is accountant, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> that's all, you know, there's about this thickness, right? You put it in your pocket, you are carrying one million dollar out of Singapore. And people criticize the Singapore government for holding a $10,000, printing a $10,000 note because it encourages corruption. It's the easiest way to, like that is one million, like that is two, three, four, about there. In mainland China, the biggest denomination is 100 renminbi. So you want to bribe people, why? You must have one big baggage of thing, right? So, but you know, it doesn't stop people. Recently in China, there is corruption case. The guy had room full of renminbi and US dollars, stack full. Highest US dollar denomination is 100 US dollar. Now, do you understand how much faith you exercise when you carry this piece of paper? You are actually believing that this stack is a million bucks that you can buy your house. I mean, most of you, lah, your house, my house, your house, your car, everything all thrown in with 100 pieces of paper or less. And you are trusting in a system that works because the paper says so. And it is something that requires tremendous faith. I sometimes think you need more faith to believe in this than in God, really. I have a friend who is a lecturer in economics in University of Pennsylvania. That's one of the big uni universities there, so I pay him a visit. We we're having tea, and so he, he does econs and finance and all that, and a brilliant guy. So I ask him, you know, anybody know what's happening in the world today, all this financial system, all that? He looked at me and said, no. I said, what do you mean, no? He said, I don't know, we just print paper money and we just declare it in the value. You know, in the past, every single US dollar that is printed is backed up by gold. You must have the same amount of gold. But since President Richard Nixon's time, the gold standard is dissolved. And now, when you say that this is a $10,000 thing, you are trusting that it's a $10,000 thing. There is no equivalent value of gold to back up. And even if there were, you are trusting that the gold is going to be useful. You know, if the whole system is just a whole system of faith. So don't tell me that faith in God is such a ridiculous thing because you have faith in more ridiculous thing. A piece of paper printed like this. When I was young, I, I used to draw currency of my own. You know, <laughs> at that time there was no photostatic machine. Um, in secondary school, you know, I'm good at art. My friends and I, we would draw ten dollar note on a piece of paper. It's illegal, by the way, with color pencil and it's quite realistic. Then we would we would stick a piece of string to it and put it on the road and then put it on the corridor of the school and then see whether people pick it up. And when people come, we just put it, put it, put it. It's a piece of paper. But you trust that a piece of paper will bring you whatever it is. So that is a kind of entry-level faith. And this sort of entry-level faith is everywhere, by the way. Everything we do, you fly here in a plane, you take a train. Oh, well, that doesn't quite work in Singapore anymore. You, you go into a lift, you, what is it? you are in school, you trust a policeman. Even the water you drink is an act of faith in Singapore. I don't know about you, but in my house, we just drink off the tap. Because Mr. Lee Kuan Yew said that we should do that, you know. In Bangkok, in, in the hotel, and I was putting the mineral water into the kettle to boil, and Patricia said, hey, oh, you waste mineral water. Use the tap water and boil it. I said, wow, well, obviously you don't know about Bangkok water. It's not just boiling. It's a question of heavy matter as well, right? Whether it's lead, mercury, <laughs> copper, whatever nonsense there is in the water. So therefore, to turn on the tap to drink the water in Singapore, Excuse me, in Singapore, it means I need water. <laughs> it means that you are placing a lot of faith in the entire system. And we don't think about that. And that's the kind of entry-level faith that we are familiar with. The second level of faith is a little bit deeper. I will coin the word futile faith or faith that doesn't work. And there are many aspects of this. For example, simply, 
believing in God's existence. That God exists. A, a, a simple thing. Sometimes you ask people, do you believe that God exists? You say, well, yeah, yeah. The late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew used to say that. Mr. Lee said that. Well, if you ask me, do I believe in God? I will say, I don't know. Do I not believe in God? He's, he will say, I don't know also. So simply believing or not believing in God or believing in other kind of gods. Uh, this is futile because it will lead to nowhere. Thank you, dear. And there are, of course, many different gods out there. And, you know, even with the passing of the late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, true enough, people quickly make him into a god. <laughs> On the internet, I saw an old ama putting his face in the altar and then put the hue and everything, and all of a sudden he becomes a god. And it's quite typical. In Taiwan, for example, there are at least two Chiang Kai-sek temples, Chiang Kong Miao, Chiang Kai-sek temple. People go in and pray to Chiang Kai-sek, Chiang, Chiang Chang Jie Si, who is the guy who brought a whole gang of them from China to uh, 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 Taiwan. People pray to him like a god. No matter how sincere you are in praying to Chiang Kai-sek, to Lee Kuan Yew and all that, it is futile. It will not go anywhere. And sometimes I must admit that people can be very, very sincere. For example, Sometimes when you go to the temples in Singapore, you look at the people, you know. I, I've seen one a whole gang of women who look like rich Thai Thai and they were squatting on the floor, scrubbing the temple floor. They were scrubbing away and all that kind of thing, working very hard at it. And your heart goes out to them because they are very sincere, but sincerely mistaken because it is a futile faith. Other kind of futile faith are, for example, believing in believing, faith in faith. And this is something that permeates the church today also. That we want to believe that our faith will mean something. That I put something into faith. I want to believe in believing. And so even the popular, there are many popular songs that tell you this. There can be miracles if you believe. You know, if you believe, there can be miracles. So I have to believe, believe, believe. So if I don't know miracle, means that I don't believe enough. This is called faith in faith. And it is also futile and from the apostle James believing in a deedless faith a faith that has no impact a faith that has no outward appearance a faith that is dead you know and this is futile faith because it leads to nowhere and in verse 19 the apostle James really gave us a very stark kind of a statement you believe that God is one you do well even the demons believe and shudder. So all this kind of futile faith means nothing because even the devil have some sort of faith and the believing of God is nothing. And you think it's a big deal that, oh, I believe in God, big deal. God must, must care for me. God must, must treasure me because I believe in him. That's a very consumer mentality, you know. That's nothing because James says, even the devils, the demons, they believe and they shudder before God. So you are no better than the demons if you just believe in God and that's about it because that means nothing. Now what we want to talk about of course when we use the word faith in the Bible is we are actually talking about saving faith. So what exactly are we talking about? This is the type of faith that really matters to God. The type of faith of those who are truly saved as described by God's word. Not by what I say, not by what Patong say, not by what anybody else say, but the kind of faith as described by God's word. I want to emphasize this very, very much so. And in a Reformed evangelical understanding, it is all about what the word of God says. doesn't matter what other very articulate speaker out there say about what faith is, you want to go back to the word of God. And it is not those who simply say they believe or assume they are saved. But saving grace is upon those who are truly saved. And so from there, the Apostle James then gives examples of what he meant. In verse 20, Do you want to be shown, your, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? That James wants to tell you that anybody who has saving faith will have deeds of faith. They will exemplify it somehow. They will work it out somehow. They will show it somehow. In the earlier passage, he talked about how it is about working among the poor, and here he talks about deeds of faith. 
and he used Abraham as an example. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works. Again, the faith was there first, but this is proven by the deeds of faith that he had. Earlier passage, a lot more shallow about good works, working among the poor, showing that your faith helped them, extend to them, because that's part of what God wants us to do. And this passage now is about the deeds of faith. Why was Abraham chosen? Abraham, of course, is a very, very important person. Uh, in your responsive reading, we read from Genesis 22, that particular passage relating to what James was talking about. Abraham is so unusual that we often know him as the father of three monotheistic faith, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. Uh, collectively, these are called the Abrahamic faith, meaning all three faiths proclaim Abraham to be an important portion of their faith, the father of all three faiths. Not only that, The Bible proclaimed Abraham to the fa- as the father of all who believes. Romans chapter 4, verse 11. And as you have read, a friend of God, James chapter 2, verse 23. And this particular passage that uh, James has uh, quoted is a beautiful passage and very intriguing. And throughout history, many people portray it in many different art forms. The one on the left is the one that Patong liked the best by Rembrandt. Uh, the slaying of Isaac. So as you have read in the Bible, Abraham was tested, his faith was tested when he was asked to sacrifice his son like a ram, you know, like a, like a, like a goat uh, for God. And so in all the portrayal, there's always a lamb somewhere, stuck somewhere because he's showing that at the final moment right before Abraham was to slaughter Isaac, a lamb was given. Not only was it very popular in media, medieval time, in you know, long ago when people painted. It's also popular today in uh, pictures, shows, uh, movie, TV shows everywhere. The same kind of uh, illustration was given when Abraham wanted to sacrifice Isaac. And so some people look at it and think of this as a very dramatic and very crazy kind of idea that God should test someone to kill his own son. The book of Hebrews explained this like this. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was the fact, was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom he was said, Through Isaac shall your offering be named. And people think about the offering of Isaac as a very cruel act, unreasonable, it's really dumb thing of God. And, and it proves that God is very crazy, bloodthirsty. Not true, because the book of Hebrew explained it this way in the next verse. He considered that God was able to even raise him from the dead, from which figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. In other words, the author of Hebrew identified the real reason why Abraham was willing to sacrifice Isaac. Because it was not just a dumb act or a blind faith. The book of Hebrews explained that Abraham had so much faith in God that he knew that God was able to resurrect Isaac. Why did he know that? Because God promised him that through Isaac, the offerings or the, denom- the, the descendants will be as numerous as the stars of the sky and the sands on the beach. And so Abraham had tremendous faith in God. He was willing to sacrifice Isaac because he knew by faith, that God is going to hold on to his promise. And so the scripture was fulfilled in verse 23. Hebrew says, uh, 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 the apostle James says, and the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and he was counted to him as righteousness and he was called a friend of God. The faith of Abraham saved him. And it was not just a faith that is completely blind, but a saving faith. But my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, James mentioned Abraham also to tell us that his faith was confirmed through his deeds of faith, not just a faith that you talk about. Are you a Christian? Yes, I am. What have you done in your life? Nothing. I'm just a Christian. I have faith, but that's about it. Not this sort of faith, but the faith that is shown through life. And such faith cannot possibly be without corresponding deeds. This is a consistent teaching from our senior pastor, 
the Reverend Dr. Stephen Tong as well. So much so that Dr. Tong believed that faith must have an absolute necessity of suffering, absolute necessity of trials, absolute necessity of growth in a step-by-step -step manner. Why? Because Dr. Tong said even Jesus Christ cannot escape from that formula, let alone people like us. So when you say that you have faith, this faith must be seen through deeds of faith, through actions of faith. It cannot possibly be something that is deep down in your heart, a kind of warm and fuzzy feeling, but something that must translate to actual deeds that other people can see. And just in case you don't understand this, James went on to give another illustration in verse 25. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. James was referring to Joshua chapter 2 where Rahab hikes the spy. So if you read Joshua 2, you will know that Joshua sent uh, the spies, two spies into the city of the, the Canaanites and he wanted to go and find out whether he can attack the city and so the soldiers of the enemies went after them and Rahab who was a prostitute hit the two spies from the enemies and from the soldiers and the two spies was able to escape and later on Rahab asked the two spies to spare her family and the two spies says fine you go and tie a red string on your window and when we attack the city we will spare your family and that's exactly what happened so why was Rahab mentioned? And not only was she mentioned, the prostitute is mentioned there. You know, my office is in Geylang, right at the fringe of the red light district. So every time I go out during lunchtime, you see all the working girls there. Work very hard, you know, foreign talent. Early in the morning, 9 o'clock, they are already at work. And they all stand the street and all that. And guess what? They never pull me before, you know. I don't know, maybe I look like a Cheng Hu Lang or the Hong Kokian say, like government guy. So nobody ever approached me before. Maybe I got an aura kind of a thing, a pastor coming or something. And, and, and it's quite interesting in a way to sit down there sometimes or to stand out there and watch the street walker walk the street. And it's quite a crazy place, I must say. One of the places in Singapore which really in Hokkien is Bo Cheng Hu, right? like no government. People ride motorbike against the traffic. Uh, people sell fake Viagra. That I don't understand. Uh, it's like everywhere, okay? Everywhere, people are selling fake Viagra. You can die eating those crap things. Okay, by the way, none of you are other men. I better don't go and eat these all stupid things. And I keep wondering why. And the police will come. One hour later, they will be back. The house flies. They are everywhere. And, you know, every time you look at the prostitutes and all that, there is this deep sense of intrigue and also a sense of sadness that people will have to do that as a living to sell their bodies and I always wonder what is behind each person what's their story because remember they too are made in the image and likeness of God right and it's just something which is very strange and of course naturally a lot of us very high and mighty we look at prostitutes and we say ah oh, it's, it's, it's disgusting at the lowest level of humanity blah 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 you know whatever it is and here you have in the Bible in the Bible okay Rahab the prostitute and once again, it calls to mind that even the lowest among us is to made in the image and likeness of God. And so why this particular prostitute person? The answer is found in Joshua chapter 2, verse 11. Dr. Stephen Tong liked to point out that Rahab was so emphasized in the Bible that the Bible gave a lot of space to her, you know, as she speak. The Bible doesn't record many words of women. Uh, I think the longest one will be Abigail, the wife of David. Then possibly the second in length uh, will be Rahab, as she explained why she saved the spies. Rahab says that we have heard about all you Israelites for a long time, and whenever we, we hear you, in verse 11, as soon as we heard it, our hearts melt. We heard about you attacking all the Canaanites, our help melt. And there was no spirit left in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above, and on the earth beneath. In other words, Rahab had faith. She had faith that the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob is a God who is in heaven above and on the earth beneath. She was a person that demonstrated such a faith. 
And so the author of Hebrews in the New Testament then declare, By faith Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had been given a friendly welcome to the spies. And Rahab was so honored that Matthew chapter 5 actually lists Rahab as part of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Uh, chapter 5 verse 5, the prostitute is listed there. And so church tradition says that after Rahab rescued the spy, she did not continue as a prostitute. Some people say that she married Joshua finally and was the maybe the ancestors of prophets like Ezekiel and Jeremiah. But the Bible is not too clear about that, but that's an interesting way to look at it. Uh, high likelihood that after she was spared, she didn't go back to her old line again. And that's why she's listed in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, meaning that she's part of the ancestry of Joseph, the physical uh, adoptive father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so remember that every person is made in the image and likeness of God. And the faith that Rahab demonstrated accorded her the kind of place that the Bible has for them. I once read the Christian writer Philip Yancy. He wrote that, you know, when Jesus was walking among us, all the prostitutes and all the greatest sinners, the tax collectors, all the people that the world hate, they all flock to Jesus Christ. They love him. They, were, they are with him. They, they are with him all along the way. But now that Jesus is in heaven and we represent him, all the prostitutes, tax collectors, biggest sinners, they run away from us. And Philip Yancy said, I wonder why. It's a very good question to ask. So be very careful with the words in our mouth. So at the end, in verse 26, as we close chapter 2, the Apostle James once again reminded us, For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. In summary then, what exactly are we talking about? What then shall we do with all these many, many kind of a teaching? I will want to encourage you, first of all, to understand what this faith is all about. To understand what really do you mean when we say we are Christian. And again, sometimes we are misguided by evangelical movement. People say, oh, you know, you just say this little prayer and then you become a Christian and that's about it. You want to really understand what faith is all about and what we are talking about. And you want to understand it primarily by God's word. Not by the words of teachers or preachers or slogans or car bumper stickers and, and stuff like that. You want to understand it primarily by God's word. And I will tell you that if you understand God's word clearly, you will see that everything that I have preached to you is in accordance to his word. It's not like I want you to go out there and do a lot of good deeds, so therefore I preach like that. No, it is exactly what the Bible has said. Now, we spend some time talking about false teachers, hyper grace, all these things. How come people don't know? How come, why, why are there like 33,000 people queuing up for that kind of worship service? The answer is because most of them do not know the word of God. They don't. They cannot identify it. They, they don't know that the preacher is talking nonsense because they don't read the Bible. They don't understand the Bible. They don't want to read the Bible as well. So you need to understand it because that will give you the ability to come out of ignorance, come out of darkness and into light. And you want to know from the word of God that faith is not just about a warm and fuzzy feeling inside your heart. Oh, I feel good. So this is a good worship service. It's not, not just about that. Saving grace according to the word of God is transformative faith. And it will <clears throat> manifest itself through the deeds of faith in your life. So make the determination to not live out faith as a warm and fuzzy feeling for the rest of your life, but to live out a faith that is real, that is exemplified, that is manifested out through deeds of faith. And the deeds of faith can be deeds of faith relating to the poor among us, which I believe is the primary ex manifestation of our faith. It is also deeds of faith as we treat each other in the things that we do, in the things that we say, in the things that we express, the deeds and acts that we do in our life. Some of you sit there and say, wow, this all sounds so complicated. How am I going to do anything? Again, I refrain. I repeat my refrain. You want to start small, you want to start soon, whatever the case is, you want to start. So what is it in your life that you feel 
that you it is missing. Is it with your spouse? Have you ever been like a kind of a mean person to your spouse in the deeds that you do in your life, the words that you say to each other? I always tell all the couples that come before me in marital counseling that it is about work, right? You got to keep working at it. And it, the spouse is the closest one. And of course, then your kids is the, is the next one. So if you feel or if you know that you have really been uh, nasty towards each other or whatever it is, then you start there, right? You say you have faith in Jesus Christ, you have faith in the Bible, you have faith in God. Then listen to what the words say, you know? Treat each other with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life. Start right there where you are. Can you expand it a little bit further? Your neighbors, people around you, that person who is working in your workplace, fellow who is seems to be in trouble. Can you talk to them? Can you help them? Can you offer words of comfort? Can you have deeds of faith among them? Sometimes the people who laugh the most happen to be the people who are in the greatest need. My daughter is going to attend a wake afterwards. One of her friends jumped off a building and she said that, hey, you know, that person seemed to be the happiest among us, cracking jokes all the time, but very depressed because he can't find a job, life is not going well and all that. Can you find that person? Can you identify that person? And from there, can you expand even further to the people outside of the people you know, stranger on the street, that little boy who study by the light of the McDonald's? Can you go out there and touch the orphans and the widowless, we fatherless among us all. And I tell you that when we do all that, we will understand what our faith truly is all about. Because Jesus Christ said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And Jesus Christ cannot possibly be wrong. May the Lord speak to us in our hearts this morning so that we will live a life of saving faith, not faith that is futile. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for your word that continues to speak to us in all generations. For indeed, as the psalmist says, it is a lamp unto our feet and light unto our pathway. Confusing as it is in the world, if we know your word well, if we understand what you have to say to us well, we will know the direction to go and how we should live our life. Help us, O oh God, to be determined to do that. Maybe we need to start small in our life, a little bit of improvement in our life here and there as we commit ourselves to you. When we look at our spouse, do we want to say mean things to them? Do we want to be cold? Do we want to be uncaring? How do we want to say, let me start here, let me show the love of Jesus Christ and forgiveness to each other, touch lives. When we look at co-workers, do we want to quarrel? Do we want to be unforgiving? Do we want to stare at each other and act just like the rest of the world? Or do we want to say that since Jesus said we are to love even our enemies, so what small people we work with? Let us look around our life and help us understand that you have made us for that very purpose, to be a channel of your blessing, not just live life for ourselves or for our own loved one alone. For if that were the case, we are no different, as Jesus Christ said, than the tax collectors and the pagans. Help us, O God, to be like stars in the universe, as the Apostle Paul says, shining in the place of complete desperate darkness. And your word continue to remind us that there is a purpose for us in our individual lives, that you have given us our resources and talent for a purpose, so that we will have faith that is not dead, living faith, saving faith, faith like a light that will shine forth around the people all around us. Help us to understand that and be determined to live out this faith in our life. And the irony is that the more we live for you, the more joyous we become, the more thankful we become, the more appreciative we become, and the happier we can be. Help us to be happy people, O Lord. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.